Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the start of the 21st season of the Faith and Life Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, the senior pastor of St. Philip Deacon, which is privileged to offer these events as a community service, and we're delighted to have you all here. So welcome to each and every one of you, whether you're here in our sanctuary or if you're joining us online. Um, <clears throat> I do always like to ask the question, if anyone here has not ever been to a Faith and Life event in the past. Is this your first Faith and Life event for any of you? Fabulous. Some of you, and I imagine there are many of you online as well, so a special welcome to all of you. As I mentioned, for 20 years now, we've been inviting wonderful, thoughtful, engaging speakers to come and speak about how faith, uh, Christian faith is connected to different dimensions of everyday life. So that's included authors, it's included business leaders, it's included musicians and artists and um, athletes. <clears throat> Interestingly, it has included very few theologians or pastors or priests, so tonight's speaker is a bit of an outlier on that front. <clears throat> um, and he is, in fact, uh, his role is the presenter at Westminster Abbey uh, in London, where he is responsible for the worship life of the Abbey, which includes, in the last year, big events like the coronation of King Charles III, and before that, of course, the funeral of uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and he's gonna speak a bit about that in a minute. Uh, I will say a couple of other words about um, our speaker in a second. I will remind both those of you who are watching online as, as well as those of you who are here in the house, um, after his uh, talk, there will be an opportunity for questions. So if you're here with us physically, we have a mic to my right and to my left, so please be thinking of things you'd like to ask him after he's done speaking. Uh, if you are joining us virtually, you can send us uh, questions to either an email address, which is social at spdlc.org, social at spdlc.org, uh, or you, there should be a box inviting you to offer questions on the live stream uh, application that you're on on the Faith and Life uh, website. And folks in the control room, I hope I got that right. If I didn't, someone come out and yell at me. <clears throat> So he is the presenter at Westminster Abbey, which means he's responsible for the worship life of the Abbey, as I said. I always like to include a few details about our speakers, though, that are not part of their sort of formal bio. Um, and so I actually have a few things I'll share tonight. The first, and I, and I had the privilege of sitting down with him this summer um, when my wife Amy and I were in England for a couple of weeks and had a delightful conversation. One of the things I did not know about him until today is that before becoming a, a priest, he was actually what they call in uh, Great Britain a veterinary surgeon. Um, in specializing, by the way, in canine internal medicine. Um, and in fact, as, as if he's like some poster boy for England, he did it in the shadow of where James Harriet uh, practiced in near Yorkshire. So that's an interesting fact. Another fact is when he comes up here, you will see that he is wearing a medal or as they call it in Great Britain, a gong. That is for uh, his membership now in the Royal Victorian Order. So be, after his name is a comma and then MVO, member of the Victorian Order. Kate Middleton, Princess Kate, if you watch any coverage of the coronation service, is wearing a robe or a mantle of the Victorian order. And so he was granted that for his work on both the coronation and the funeral was granted by the monarch for service to the monarch. I know. <laughs> <clears throat> and the final thing I will say, which just demonstrates how his life is slightly different than my life as a priest, at a place like Westminster Abbey, just in the last couple of weeks, I think he said, the dean, who is the senior pastor at the Abbey, called him to his office, to the dean's office, so that he could meet the star of film and stage, Emma Thompson, <laughs> which has never happened to me yet. <laughs> Anyway, we are so glad he has taken time to fly over the pond to be with us tonight. Will you join me in wel welcoming the Reverend Mark Birch? Well, good evening. A, a tremendous privilege to be with you this evening. I'm sorry, I only get the, I only get the medal, I don't get the mantle. <laughs> Never mind. I'm so grateful to you, Pastor Tim, for your invitation to come and share these thoughts about what happened in Westminster Abbey a mere five months ago. Can't believe it. And perhaps more importantly, what, what 
God might have been saying and doing through it. Uh, and I bring the greetings from the Dean and Chapter, those who govern the Abbey, and hope, this is a bit of a commercial pitch, hope that many of you might have a chance to come and visit us at some point. It is an extraordinary place. So this evening, I hope to offer uh, a bit of history, a bit of theology, a bit of personal memoir. So I hope there's going to be a bit of something for everybody uh, to reward those of you who have come out on a, on a very wet, very London-like evening. <laughs> Let me first try and tell you something about the Abbey. Say, I've been there for nearly nine years, and I've never stopped discovering. There's a real, the word, best word I can think of it is a density about the Abbey. Um, and not just because it's full of stuff, though it is full of stuff. It's packed full of tombs and memorials over the centuries. One writer has described the Abbey as like a bag lady, which is a hardly hardly a respectful way to talk about a building or a person for that matter I think what he means is that we just keep adding stuff the abbey is a bit of a hoarder the builder building just carries more and more we never throw anything away and even with all the cleaning that went on before the coronation we, we kind of gilded gates and, and, and dusted the top of, of, of stalls and things. But the Abbey never feels pristine, which is one of the things I quite like about it. It's sort of defiantly dense and complex and cluttered with the accretions of centuries, like, like barnacles on the bottom of a boat. Some things have faded or crumbled or worn out. Some have been defaced, but we've never thrown anything away. More polite writers have described the Abbey as a palimpsest, uh, like a, a, a sheet of paper or, or parchment or, or a canvas that has been written over or painted over again and again and again. Generation after generation have made their own statements on the stones of the Abbey, and yet it's never quite erased what went before. It's left faint traces. So you'll see little bits of 13th century carving peeping out from behind enormous 18th century monuments. So bag lady or palimpsest, the abbey really rewards those who take time to look really carefully and to follow all the hints and traces that connect us to the generations and particularly the monarchs who have left their mark on the place. So the Abbey has a physical density to it, to it, which some people would call clutter, but that comes with a, a real density of history, meaning, of significance. So let me take you back into some of the mistier realms of our history. Towards the end of 1065, Edward, King of England, was beginning to falter after a long and largely peaceful reign. He was lying in his new palace in Westminster, west of the city of London, with its Eastminster, otherwise known as St Paul's Cathedral, and he was watching the finishing touches being made to the new Abbey Church next door. Some of you might know the Bayer Tapestry, an amazing record of the Norman invasion of England, which shows the weather vane, the cockerel, being put on the top of the tower of the Abbey, completing the project the biggest single building in the country, an unmistakable symbol of Christian faith at the heart of Edward's kingdom. And on the 5th of January, 1066, the old king died and was buried the next day on the Feast of the Epiphany, not bad for a king, just in front of the high altar of his new abbey. Edward, of course, died childless, and when the inevitable battle for the succession, the Battle of Hastings, concluded later that year, the victorious William, Duke of Normandy, was determined that there was only one place where he would be crowned king. It had to be in the Abbey at Westminster, on the very spot where Edward had been buried. William wanted to make that unmistakable physical link with his predecessor, and it happened on Christmas Day at the end of that fateful year. And 956 years and five months later, Ch 
Charles III was crowned on the very same spot, albeit in a very different abbey in the one that was built in the 13th century. And he was the 40th reigning monarch to be crowned on that spot, one succeeding the other, layering that site with significance, with meaning. It is extraordinary to think of the monarchs who have come to that place over the centuries. From Henry V, who defeated the French at Agincourt, to George VI, who saw the defeat of the Nazi German regime with a bit of help from his friends. <laughs> from Elizabeth I, who saw the great expansion of British trade and the first attempt at colonisation in New England, to Victoria, who ruled an empire on which it was said the sun never set. And then from George III, who mourned the loss of the American colonies. We still mourn them. <laughs> to Elizabeth II, who saw so many colonised nations gaining their independence, mostly peacefully, and who did so much personally to sustain and, and create those bonds of affection across the former empire within what's, what's now called the Commonwealth of Nations. And the Commonwealth has the Abbey as its spiritual home. So that place, that spot, is layered, saturated, dense with history and with the experience of a nation. It's a focus of, of identity. It's the place we Brits come back to again and again to learn who we've been, who we are, who we might yet become. And of course, this place is a church. The monarch is crowned seated before the altar. We have a 19th century mosaic behind the altar depicting Christ breaking the bread at the Last Supper. And the first thing the king did after his enthroning was to offer bread and wine for the Eucharist so that he and the queen could make their communion, acknowledging their complete dependence on Christ, as do we all. And underneath the coronation chair, fully exposed for the first time, we think, for centuries, was what we call the Cosmati pavement, a 13th century mosaic that spreads out like a carpet in front of the high altar, ordered by King Henry III to express something of the Christian meaning of coronation and to leave no one in any doubt about the significance of that spot and what has happened there now 40 times. Let me tell you a bit more about that pavement. It is, it is the finest to be found north of the Alps, although you'll find some very, very fine examples in Rome. But originally, the intricate pattern of interconnected circles, it's worth looking up on the website, was surrounded by a, by a text in brass letters. It's a strange, like a sort of medieval riddle, and a text that suggested that this pavement, this carpet, represents the cosmos, the whole created order and that it looks towards the end of time when Christ will return as judge and as king. And the earthly king is crowned right in the middle of that, on the orb that represents the earth, the place where Christ will sit in judgment. So the king, in a way, represents the heavenly king of kings. He's there to represent Christ and call to reflect his just and gentle rule. So it all speaks very powerfully of the, the sacred calling of the monarch. If King, the Charles managed, if King Charles managed to look up, he would have seen over the high altar the words from Revelation 11:15: The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. There is no doubt where kingship comes from, in whose name kings rule, and the true kingdom that they must serve In an addition to the traditional service and, and innovation this time, His Majesty was welcomed into the Abbey that day by a young person, albeit one dressed rather fabulously, looked a bit like a playing card and a for grand tunic. Um, but the King was welcomed with these words. As children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. To which His Majesty responded, in his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. 
Since St Dunstan prepared the coronation service for King Edgar in the 10th century, kings of England and later the United Kingdom have been left in no doubt that their kingship will be measured by the highest possible standard. That they are answerable not just to their nobles or indeed just to their people, but to the King of Heaven, the one who washed the feet of his disciples, who emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. I come not to be served, but to serve. And many people, I think, were surprised at the boldness of this language and the emphasis of service in a life and an institution that appears to be all about being served. Some people were a bit cynical about that. But I hope it reminded those in the UK who are inclined to sit rather light to our Christian heritage. I hope it reminded them just how radical the gospel is and how it has the potential to call earthly power to account, arguably better even than an election or a referendum. Vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God, while beloved of elected politicians, has real dangers. They were pointed out by St Alcuin as early as the 8th century. I wouldn't want to live in anything other than a democracy, but it needs checks and balances to prevent the people from becoming the mob and to prevent elected leaders believing too much in themselves that their popular mandate gives them a kind of carte blanche. So an hereditary Christian monarch <laughs> representing and answerable to the supernatural rule of love, which would seem to be the least democratic thing imaginable, provides us in the UK, I think, a kind of stability, something deeper and more abiding than just the changing currents of popular opinion. As an institution, it certainly isn't unchanging, but it operates on a long time frame a real antidote to the freneticism of the 24-hour news cycle or the emotive ephemera of social media or the weariness of the four- or five-year electoral cycle. We Brits had the same face on our postage stamps and banknotes for 70 years. At the beginning of September 2022, we became suddenly aware that Her Majesty the Queen, whose frailty had been increasingly evident, was fading quite rapidly. It was a chaotic time for us politically, and Her Majesty's last act was to accept the resignation of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister and to ask Liz Truss to form a government. I really wonder what she made of that. We saw, though, in the photos, the Queen smiling broadly, but with clear signs of bruising on her hands, consistent with a, an intravenous infusion. It was, we realise now, a, a subtle, courageous signal to her people to prepare themselves. And during the day of September the 8th, news began to come of senior royals making their way with some haste to Balmoral Castle up in Scotland. And the Abbey senior verger, who also holds a role at the Chapel Royal, it's very useful to have these people, um, he heard from staff there that they were preparing for an announcement. So the Abbey's London Bridge planning group was called to make sure our plans were all in place, and no sooner, it seemed, had we got the plans on the table than the news came through. London Bridge, code name for the Queen, had fallen. Flags were lowered, and the passing bell was tolled from the Abbey's northwest tower 96 times. And what followed was a 10-day plan, Operation London Bridge, a plan that had been developed over many years, decades even, by the palace, the abbey, the military, and various government departments. The Earl Marshal, the Duke of Nor Norfolk, who oversees all state ceremonial, he had told us a year earlier to make sure we had all our bases covered, and we'd been meeting at least monthly in the abbey to review our plans. My job was to keep the order of service updated the name of the Prime Minister was changed more times than I care to remember. <laughs> and to start writing ceremonial notes, line by line, for the funeral service, describing every move from the arrival of the coffin at the West Door at 11 o'clock 
to its departure for burial at Windsor Castle shortly after noon. I should probably explain that presenters of Westminster Abbey uh, tend to come and go. We don't generally have tenure. We are minor canons. Emphasis on the minor. Uh, uh, appointed usually for only about five or seven years. So when I picked up the London Bridge file, I was very aware of the many presenters who had worked on it before me and how indebted I was to their work. Early in 2022, I was called to the Dean's office, my boss, to be told that my contract would be extended. We think there might be one or two things coming up in the next year or so, he said. <laughs> no kidding. And the one thing that I think I'm most indebted to my predecessors for was the prayer written by John Donne, priest, poet, and dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in the 17th century, which was amazingly earmarked for the presenter to say at the funeral. And as all the inevitable amendments to the order of service started coming in my way over the course of those 10 days, the poor printers had to wait until day nine before the palace would let them start printing. I expected that prayer at any moment to be reallocated to any number of bishops or eminent ecumenical representatives. I was pretty astonished when the day came, and it was me <laughs> standing at the mic saying those words, bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven. I'm still amazed and thankful that I got to say it um, and that I got through it without making a mess of it. So there was a plan for Her Majesty's funeral, and although it took all the focus we had and gave us many sleepless nights, we knew what we had to do, and by the grace of God, we delivered it well, or at least only we knew where the cracks were. For the coronation, we had pretty much nothing. No plan, no timescale, no order of service. I had a slightly dog-eared copy of the 1953 order of service, and copies of the BBC footage to look at. But we had been tipped off that there would be changes. Like all coronations, this one would need to be adapted for our times and for a nation culturally unrecognisable from 70 years earlier. For instance, filling the abbey with only the aristocracy, bedecked with ermine tiaras and coronets, as they did in 1953, might make for a wonderful spectacle, but it would hardly represent modern Britain in all its cultural diversity. It wouldn't do justice to those who now shape our public life, including all those who came from around the Commonwealth after the war to drive buses and work in the National Health Service and help British industry recover, and who are now, and their children and their grandchildren, an integral part of our national life. So somehow this ancient Christian ceremony, last carried out 70 years ago, needed to speak to a modern, diverse and increasingly secular nation. The Dean of Westminster, the very reverend Dr David Hoyle, is a very mild-mannered man, but even he got frustrated when again and again interviewers would ask him about the service and want to know which are the religious bits. Again and again, he patiently explained that the whole service is an act of Christian worship, a Eucharist, no less, and that coronations in Westminster Abbey since 1066 have always been acts of Christian worship from end to end. The confusion of those interviewers was also reflected in some of the commentary after the service, which expressed surprise at just how religious the service was. I think it came as a surprise to some people to be reminded that in England we do have an established church <laughs> over which the king is supreme governor, that our constitution, unwritten though it is, is a Christian one with the Church of England at its heart. Now, some of you might be inclined to agree that this is a surprising state of affairs in the 21st century. It was the intolerance and intransigence of the Church of England that propelled the pilgrim mothers and fathers across the Atlantic to Plymouth Rock to seek a religious freedom that was eventually enshrined in your very much written constitution, where there would be no established religion with the legal status to oppress any other, where there would be no king as head of state, 
much less head of the church. So the coronation service on May the 6th was in some ways a real test, both for the monarchy and for the established church, to see whether both remained fit for purpose, whether they could still represent a national identity to which most, if not all, in the United Kingdom could feel committed to, part of in some way. Her late majesty, Queen Elizabeth, was famous for not saying very much. But when she did speak, it was wise to listen. At a conference in Lambeth Palace, the London Home and Office of the Archbishop of Canterbury, in 2012, she gave a striking defence of the Church of England and its establishment. Her Majesty said, I quote her, The concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and, I believe, commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. It certainly provides an identity and spiritual dimension for its own many adherents. But also, gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities, and indeed people of no faith, to live freely. Woven into the fabric of this country, the church has helped to build a better society, more and more in active cooperation for the common good with those of other faiths. Well, it took us Brits until the 19th century to realise the mistake of excluding and expelling those who could not in conscience sign up to Anglican orthodoxy. But Her Majesty helpfully expressed how an established church could have a pivotal role in underpinning an inclusive multicultural society. Without it, I suspect, there would be a profound danger that religion of all stripes would be pushed out of public life in the UK altogether. Establishment is a real bulwark against that. But it has to be regarded as a privileged responsibility rather than as a privileged right. And nowhere was that responsibility felt more profoundly than in the preparations for the coronation. Two clear instructions were given at our first meeting at the palace with the king's private secretary. One, there must be visible diversity throughout the service. And two, the whole thing must not last more than two hours. Now, on that second point, you might think that two hours would be more than enough time for any church service. But you might also know that the 1953 coronation took the best part of three hours, and Queen Victoria's in 1838 took more like five. Historically, coronation services were so long that members of the congregation were encouraged to bring lunch with them. (laughs) And I'm sorry to say that the sermon was the favourite moment to pull out the knives and forks. And then on diversity, those of you who watch the service will have noticed, uh, well, firstly, a tremendous amount of bling, lots of shiny metal and shimmering jewels known collectively as regalia, royal things, normally kept with the other crown jewels in the Tower of London. Well, traditionally, these crowns, scepters, swords, spur, rings and armels, had to look that one up, Traditionally, they are delivered to the monarch from the altar by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and they are variously put on while solemn prayers are said. Well, this was identified early on as a part of the service where perhaps other participants could be included, particularly people representing other faith communities. Now, we had to be very careful, of course, with those bits of regalia with obvious Christian symbols on them. You know, the orb surmounted by a cross symbolising Christ's dominion over the world would clearly have to be left to the archbishop. But the spurs, or the armels, which are decorative military wristbands, there you are, they could perhaps be offered by someone other than a Christian. Of course, there was still then the question of who precisely could perform this duty. It would have been difficult for leaders of other faiths to be part of what was still a Christian ceremony, a Eucharist, in front of one of the most famous Christian altars adorned with a cross and all kinds of Christian imagery. 
There was also a concern that this could look horribly like a colonial scene from bygone centuries, with people of colour in ceremonial dress approaching the throne in supplication to a white king. I don't think I need to spell it out any more than that. But this is where, in Britain, the establishment and being an established church kind of came to our aid. There's still a bit of a way to go. But in the UK Parliament, in the House of Lords, our unelected second chamber, there are a good number of distinguished men and women drawn from a whole range of different communities. But as peers of the realm, lords and ladies, they have already sworn their allegiance to the king and to his successors under law. And as faith representatives, rather than being faith leaders and being already part of the establishment, playing a role in an establishment ceremony felt less incongruous. Now, there was a lot of discussion about this, a lot of back and forth, and these things are never cut and dry and not completely tidy. And for some, they will still feel that there was a sort of poor compromise, that either the coronation should have been an entirely secular occasion or an uncompromisingly Christian one on the other. But I hope we demonstrated an established church that takes its responsibilities seriously, protecting the place of religion in our national public life, whilst also, also presenting the gospel in all its beauty and power. And nowhere, I think, was the gospel more powerfully and beautifully reflected than in the anointing of the king. Those reporters interviewing the dean, wanting to know which were the religious bits of the service, were probably thinking about the anointing. And as religious bits go, this was one of the more significant ones. Even secular-minded commentators acknowledged that this moment was one of supreme and palpable mystery. When we were given the first draft, the initial thoughts on the coronation liturgy, it looked as though we were going to have to chop out various parts of the ceremony to keep it all within the two-hour limit. Some of us thought that would be a shame. So the subsequent months saw a, a lot of conversations between various people at Lambeth, at the Abbey, and other places, and slowly and elegantly and as time efficiently as we could, reintroducing various elements from earlier coronations so that nothing would be lost. A quick example, you might remember, if you watched it, the glove worn on the king's right hand when he held the scepter, the symbol of temporal and earthly power. That wasn't going to happen. But it seemed tremendously important to some of us that there was symbolism here that shouldn't be lost. The idea that power should be held, the scepter representing power, that it should be held carefully in a, in a gloved hand rather than a naked one. This had something to say, we thought, about in a world where power is so frequently misused, presumptuously, and without any sense of responsibility. So I'm glad to say the glove returned. In fact, the more we worked on the service, the more we looked back at earlier coronations, the more responsible we felt for this incredibly rich tradition. You know, bits of it going back to medieval times, other bits into our Anglo-Saxon history, other elements stretching further still to, to biblical times, to the anointing of Solomon in the first temple in Jerusalem. And of course, like a recurring musical theme, the golden thread running through it all, the kingship of Christ, the king of kings, the lord of lords. In a Christian context, a coronation cannot be anything other than a celebration of, of his kingship. His kingship made manifest and celebrated in our midst. It makes the king a kind of a sacrament, holding his kingship in trust for a time and only in the name of the one who is the eternal king. Monarchs of the past have, of course, sometimes forgotten this or misinterpreted it, if we're being generous. Like establishment, some people have seen it as a privileged right rather than a privileged responsibility. Charles I should serve as enough of an example of what happens if you let the idea of a divine right go to your head, pun intended. 
he lost his head. King Charles III indicated at the very beginning of his coronation that he sees his kingship as an opportunity and responsibility to serve. As with his mother, Christ as servant is the clear model and the measure of his kingship. So, we all felt a tremendous responsibility to this rich tradition and to the layered and ancient symbolism of this ceremony, in particular, a responsibility not to diminish that richness and depth. In an in important sense, we needed not to be too controlling, not to try to explain everything away, not to be too quick to say, this means this and that means that, but to allow the complexity and the subtlety of the symbolism to do its work. We needed, as ever, to make room for the Holy Spirit, for God to be God, beyond anything we could explain or control or contain, and for the mystery and presence of Christ to make himself known through what we did in all his majesty and beauty. Because the one thing you can always say about God, he shows up. To go back to the anointing, this is perhaps the most historically layered and symbolically dense moment in the coronation Fragrant oil of chrism made to a closely guarded recipe is poured into a rather magnificent spoon, which is the only bit of equipment that survived the period of the English Commonwealth after Charles I was beheaded. The regalia we used in May mostly date from the mid-17th century when the monarchy was restored. The spoon, though, is 12th century, very beautiful and beautifully designed with a central ridge down the middle so that the, two, the archbishop's two fingers can pick up the oil in order to anoint the king on the hands and the breast and the head. Traditionally, a canopy was held over the monarch by four knights of the garter, the highest order of chivalry. They have the best mantles of all. And that was to shield the monarch from view during the anointing. Those of you who've watched The Crown on Netflix might remember the Duke of, Ed the Duke of Windsor, formerly Edward VIII, watching the 1953 coronation service on television in his home in exile outside Paris. And his companions ask why the cameras turn away from the Queen during the anointing. Why can't we see it, they ask. The Duke replies dryly, because you are mortal. <laughs> The traditional canopy and the role of the Garter Knights in particular was felt to be a little bit out of keeping with the desire for a more diverse and indeed youthful ceremony. Garter Knights are by their nature quite senior former prime ministers, that, that sort of thing. But the desire for privacy at that supremely significant moment of the anointing was felt to be too important. And so the idea of a, an anointing screen began to develop. And once we realised the dimensions of the screen that would be necessary to shield the king, it was clear that the screen in its three parts would need some, some pretty well-trained and highly disciplined handling, a job clearly for soldiers and an opportunity for some of the lower ranks of the military to be represented in the ceremony too. More diversity. Tick. <laughs> One of the moments that sticks most in my mind is when we first used the prototype of the screen uh, at a rehearsal in Buckingham Palace. Um, the Abbey had to be closed for a couple of weeks to allow all the necessary alterations. And so a mock-up of the east end of the Abbey was built in the Buckingham Palace ballroom, of course, to allow us to start the rehearsals. It was the King's first rehearsal, and we came to the moment of anointing. And he sat in the replica coronation chair and the soldiers carefully assembled the screens around him. You, you might remember how they solemnly sealed the three parts together and then turned around and stood guard with their heads bowed. It was precisely the same posture as the guards who stood around Her Late Majesty's coffin at the lying, lying in state in Westminster Hall. And the expression on His Majesty's face as the screen closed around him at that rehearsal was one of extraordinary focus. I might even dare to say an expression of holy fear. It was as if something of the significance of this moment 
was being revealed to him. And without really intending to do so, and this is about God turning up, by introducing the screen, we had somehow intensified the symbolism. The traditional canopy gave, created a protected space in which holy things could take place, and the screen gave that space even greater solidity. It was almost like a room within the abbey, a holy of holies, maybe even a tomb, especially given the posture of the soldiers around it. There were echoes here of Solomon being anointed king in the holy of holies in the temple in Jerusalem on the mercy seat. There were echoes here too of the Easter mystery, which we all share in baptism, of dying and being buried, entombed with Christ, the anointed one, and being raised with him. And when the king emerged from the screen and knelt before the altar, just in his plain white shirt, it had strong echoes of baptism, of a new birth in Christ. The screen itself was a rather lovely work made by the religious artist Aidan Hart, who seems to be able to turn his hand to everything from carving to icon writing. And the design was taken from a window in the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace, based on the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, depicting a tree of life with leaves bearing the names of the nations of the Commonwealth over which the king is head, with the river of life, river of the water of life flowing beneath. A hovering dove symbolizes the brooding spirit, and beneath the tree is a famous quotation from the 14th century English mystic, Julian of Norwich. It said, all manner of things shall be well. Not just a bland statement of optimism, but a deep trust in God's purpose and providence. So the king was surrounded, literally surrounded, by symbols of the spirit, of the healing of the nations, of life, of trust in God's future and his purposes for the whole creation. Very suitable for a king who's been talking about care of the environment since long before it was fashionable. Now, some slightly mischievous commentators thought that perhaps we were trying to stage some sort of magic trick, a grand illusion that we would whisk the screens away and the king would have disappeared. <laughs> but of course, what was happening was so much better than magic and so much more mysterious and glorious. I really hope that what the service showed the people of the UK, of the realms, and whoever else was kind enough to watch, that this was not just a lot of bling and peculiar ceremony, not just the exaltation of a man born into great privilege, not even the encouragement that he was a head of state talking about the importance of love and service and not just power, but that here we were saying something about human dignity, human destiny, human calling, the dignity and the destiny we all have in Christ. For we are all anointed with the Holy Spirit in baptism. We are all offered the crown of everlasting life. We are all called to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. And I hope the coronation service might speak to us all about the promises and the hope that we have in Christ, however humble or exalted we might be. And I am entirely hopeful that the celebrations in heaven will make what happened in Westminster Abbey look, frankly, a bit dull. So I hope we were able to show how monarchy and an established church can serve a socially and culturally diverse nation and offer a, a generous and inclusive space where any number of identities feel represented, they feel they have a stake. And I think we did this better than any entirely secular, secular ceremony ever could. And I hope we were able to do this without in any way diluting or dumbing down our proclamation of the gospel. It has been an extraordinary year for, um, for this minor canon and presenter. Uh, I, I certainly was not born to any of this. I, I come from a rather rural part of England and I went to a very, very ordinary school. The opportunity to play some part in these great national moments has been phenomenal. And there are anecdotes I hope to dine out on for the rest of my life. Like being called on the phone by Andrew Lloyd Webber 
not sure how he got my number, to come, <laughs> to come immediately to hear the first draft of his coronation anthem. I was the first to hear it. Like the surprising moment when a very grand lady at Buckingham Palace called me to account for the introductory words of the service. The original draft read, sisters and brothers. But as she so rightly asked, channeling my best Downton Abbey, Dame Maggie Smith, yes, my dear, but what about people who are non-binary? <laughs> or like the evening when the then Queen Consort privately visited the Abbey and we discussed questions such as, how much oil will the Archbishop want to use for the anointing? And how one might deal with the effects of a crown on one's hairdo? <laughs> there was one rather touching moment when the King had got a bit bored in one of the rehearsals and, and, and wandered off to talk to some of the soldiers. And the Archbishop turned to me, smiled and said, how did we ever end up here? <laughs> and my answer would still be, your grace, God alone knows. <laughs> One of the peculiar anxieties of a minor canon is that having written the order of service and prepared the ceremonial notes, led all the rehearsals and various briefings, when it comes to the service itself, there's not much you can do apart from set the whole thing in motion. And in the case of the coronation, that was to give a signal to the state trumpeters to sound the fanfare when the king arrived, and that would begin the big procession with all the regalia in it. And that was complicated more than a little bit by the king's carriage arriving earlier than expected, and the prince and princess of Wales, plus children, arriving late, <laughs> indeed, after the king. So there was a very quick redrafting of the processional order, and then the king stepped out of the carriage and the state trumpeters were cued. Um, a bit of adrenaline never did anyone any harm. But once you've set it in motion, all we can do is make sure we play our part properly, not fall over or sit in the wrong place, or in the case of the crown jewels, don't drop anything. <laughs> and maybe offer the odd sotto voce stage direction or a meaningful look to try and avert any disasters. How am I doing? A few more minutes? Yeah, yeah. May I? The moment, may I share with you my moment of greatest anxiety, which came two days before the coronation at the full dress rehearsal. Everyone but the king and the queen was expected to be there. Their majesties had their own private rehearsal the next day. And they sent members of their staff to stand in for them at the dress rehearsal. So the abbey was stuffed full of the great and the good, bishops and archbishops, great officers of state, dukes, duchesses, knights, danes, as well as some rather intimidatingly accomplished and eminent musicians. In short, people who are, not much used, who are much more used to giving orders than taking them standing at the front with nothing more than a radio mic, expected to bring this extraordinary collection of people into some sort of order, was me. <laughs> it was another one of those, how did I end up here moments. And as with all the best productions, the dress rehearsal was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> Can't go into too many details, but the lowest point was when it took so long to undress the king's double, get him into the coronation chair, and get the anointing screen in position around him, that the orchestra and the choir had finished Zadok the Priest long since, and left us trying to catch up with the ceremonial in deafening silence. <laughs> I don't know how many of you work with professional musicians, but I tentatively asked the director of music whether there was any chance that they could play the handle a little bit less quickly. The look on his face left me fearing for my life. <laughs> and then when we tried to re-rehearse that sequence after the main rehearsal had finished, it turned out that the soldiers carrying the screen had dismissed themselves and were already back sitting in the barracks. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody thought that was my fault, and the rehearsal with the king and queen the next day went very smoothly, and they seemed blissfully unaware of all the dramas. And... Just a month ago, as Pastor Tim kindly intimated, I was invited, or indeed commanded, to Windsor Castle, and the King made me a member of the Royal Victorian Order, um, an honour given to those who have been of personal service to the monarch. Uh, it's always lovely to be recognised for what you do, but as in the best Oscars acceptance speeches, I know I owe a great deal to a very large number of people. The joy of the Abbey is to work as part of a team of those who know how to do things really, really well. 
It's hard not to look good when you're surrounded by so many good people. And it's our huge privilege to stand ready as the Abbey at any moment to respond to the needs of our monarch and our nation. Always ready to add another little layer to the story told in Westminster Abbey, a few more barnacles on the hull. To the story of a nation held within the story of redemption by our Lord Jesus Christ. In the enduring hope that despite all the failings of our monarchs, our prime ministers, and our failings as a people, God doesn't stop calling us and calling all people to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. I said the Abbey was a dense place. That's been a very dense talk. (laughs) I hope in the Q&A afterwards we can maybe unlock one or two things. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you, Mark. That was beautiful. Um, He's going to rest his voice for a second, get a bit of water while I make a couple of announcements. Um, First of all, just a reminder about the next event. This is in your program. If you're here um, in the sanctuary, if you're not, you can find this on the website, of course. Our next speaker is Tori Hope Peterson. Uh, She's the author of a book called Fostered. Um, She herself was a foster child and advocates for fostering. Uh, The title of her talk is Faith and Pattern, Shattering Generational Curses. That's on November 16th, again here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. If you would like to be reminded of future events, please um, look us up on all the social media uh, channels or you can subscribe to our emails uh, at the Faith and Life website. Um, Let me also say a word of thanks. Um, I was chatting with Mark earlier about the series in the last 20 years, now beginning the 21st year. Uh, If you've been here before, you know this because I I mention it every time. From the start, it was really important to me that these were free and open to anyone who wanted to join us for them. Uh, And that has been possible from day one thanks to the generous support of countless individuals and organizations. Uh, They are listed here. I hope we haven't left any off. If we have, and I apologize for that, please let me know. Let me just remind you of our um, corporate underwriters, Crossroads Financial Group, Cressa, Ulrich Real Estate Group, Mali Design, Productivity Inc., Rapid Packaging, and Mastercraft Labels. And then you see the list of others. Um, I am so grateful to each and every one of you who support the series financially, which allow us to bring people like Mark in. Uh, I know many of you who are here tonight are among those supporters. Will you join me in thanking them? I also want to thank Jeff Elstead. Jeff has been with the series from the very beginning and uh, gives us wonderful intro and outro music. So Jeff, thank you for being with us as always. And uh, an invitation. Um, Mark mentioned um, his work on on putting together, obviously, the services of both the coronation and the funeral. Um, If you're interested in watching a video about his work uh, that's put out by Westminster Abbey, uh, and if you're interested in hearing what I thought was some of the most beautiful part of a very beautiful service, namely those prayers at the end of the Queen's uh, funeral service, concluding with Mark uh, reading a poem or a prayer by John Donne, which I thought was absolutely stunning, and you read it beautifully. Um, You can find links to both of those videos on the podcast that I just put out actually yesterday. So just go to YouTube and you can search Reflections on Faith, and you'll find yesterday's podcast, and you can listen to what I have to say if you want. If you don't want to hear what I have to say, just click to the links of those videos because they're both worth watching. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say for now. So again, uh, if you have questions and you're here in the sanctuary, please come forward to one of the mics. If you have questions and you're at home, again, uh, email social at spdlc.org or include a question in the box uh, on the live stream. Um, so. Mark, if you'll join us again, I'll, we'll begin the Q&A, and I hope someone has some questions.
if the Abbey Walls could talk, what story from its long, illustrious history would you like to know more about? Oh, wow. Um, if the Abbey could talk. Thank you. <laughs> wow. There are all kinds of moments where I'd, I'd love to have been there. So when Edward, King Edward, who became Edward the Confessor, when he was put into his new shrine, this is in the uh, 11th century, his first shrine in the 11th century, in attendance, so, his, so, so Edward's body was carried by uh, various princes, but included King Henry II, and the person who took the service uh, was Thomas Beckett of Canterbury. Sermon was given by Elred of Revo, another amazing, amazing person. But, but, but to think that Thomas Beckett and Henry II, the king who had him killed, you know, that they were, they were both... In, if you ever go to the shrine in Westminster Abbey, it's quite a sort of intimate space. And, and the thought that, you know, that, that being there with those two people there, and they were already kind of a bit at odds at that stage. Um, that kind of moment. I think the time when I would like to, if I could uh, go back in time and just sort of physically see the Abbey and, 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 and just get a sense of, of the aesthetics of it, um, I think I'd go for the early 14th century when I think it was at its height. We've got one or two wonderful things in our collection in the galleries, including a, uh, a 14th century altar book with the most beautifully illuminated um, also made at that time was what's called the Liber Regalis, which contained is the earliest manuscript of the of the coronation service. We still we still have that. Also beautifully illuminated. Um, the the Abbey I would think was sort of artistically at its height at that stage. The English traditionally made some of the finest copes in Europe. Um, had some of the finest needlework. The Abbey apparently had a spectacular collection <laughs> uh, of, of of copes. So I'd I'd like to go back to that time. Um, yeah, that's a really good, really good question. Thank you. I hope I've kind of half answered it. I do have one online question. Am I on or not? I do, don't think so. Sorry. Let's try. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I do have an online question. How did it come to be that the holy oil was consecrated in Jerusalem? Is that true all the time or just for King Charles? That was just for King Charles, and it was it was a recognition of. Let me get this right. His, uh, his, um, uh, his f uh, father's mother is buried on the Mount of Olives, I think. Um, so the oil was taken from the Mount of Olives. Uh, it was also uh, an important. It, it, it was it was so. It was partly the king wanted it done that way, and also the Archbishop of Canterbury as a sort of as, as an ecumenical gesture. Um, to the churches in Jerusalem. So it was blessed by the Orthodox Patriarch as well as the Anglican Bishop there and one or two others. Um, so it, it, it was, it, 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 again, it, it added layers to the symbolism. No, traditionally the oil wouldn't have been brought from Jerusalem. It would have been olive oil. They managed to obtain one another way. The other thing was that the, they didn't quite use the traditional recipe. The traditional recipe, if there are any vegetarians among you, would make you kind of... <laughs> so this was a, a plant-based <laughs> anointing oil. It was very beautiful. So, so one of, one of, again, one of my memories of the day was um, at about half past six in the morning, um, I, I, I saw the dean walking through the abbey with a flask of oil, <laughs> and he said, can you come and help me get it into the, into the ampulla, the thing shaped like a dove that the archbishop brought it out of? So we, 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 we stood at the altar in front of St. Edward's Shrine, um, sort of hands like this, <laughs> trying try, try to get this oil into this ampulla. And of course, you know, oil gets, gets everywhere. So we kind of realized our hands sort of smelled of this incredible, heady scent. And, and as the king was anointed, those of us who were sitting up in the Sacrarium by the altar, the scent was just sort of coming out in great wafts. Amazing, beautiful. I'm wondering if you can touch on what became one of the more controversial aspects of the ceremony and the homage portion. It yes. seemed like it was a very, um, it had great democratic intentions in terms of having everyone pay homage. Also seemed like a very tidy solution to excluding some royal dukes. 
Um, how did the planners react to that very strong reaction? Yes. <laughs> so in 53, uh, it was suggested that then Prime Minister, I think, suggested that uh, there should be somebody to represent what they called the common man <laughs> in, in the homage in 53, and it was put aside. They said, no, no, we can't, we can't go there. So this time there was... Uh, they, they, they'd certainly, the decision had, had been made pretty early on that the homage needed to be reduced considerably and needed not to be a, such a huge element. Um, I still think the homage is due, given that what the king, you know, in, 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 in our British context, what the king represents, you know, he is, he is, he is, an, he is a, an anointed and crowned, he is, me, he is meant to be a sort of a, a sacrament, in a sense. And so some sort of reverence is, feels to me quite naturally due. Um, yeah, but, 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 it, but it, went, it, it went very wrong just a few days beforehand because the, 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 the decision had been made to use a, uh, a fairly standard formula about, about sort of, you know, pledging allegiance to you and to your, your majesty and to, your, to his successors according to law. And, but but, but the, it was the press spun it in such a way that it was, you know, oh, well, now you're going to have to decide, aren't you? Come to you know, people out there in Britain, you've got to decide, are you for the king or are you against the king? Um, which was unfortunate, to say the least. So we ended up with a rather odd form of words, which I hope are going to be consigned to history and never reused, because they, they really were rather inelegant, where it was sort of, you were kind of invited, if you wish, to say the words in front of you. Um, so uh, I... Yeah, that, that, that was... Yeah, that was that ended up being the most controversial moment, and and ended up with some pretty quick revisions, sort of at the, at the last moment. And I'm and I'm not sure we quite got it right, but but I think I think the principle that you know that, that, that those of us who wish should should be able to make or, or at least feel represented in those who are doing homage to the king, you know, recognizing his you know God-given authority. That's you know if you're going to if you're going to crown a king in a church, then the authority is God-given. So, does that come close? You were obviously following it really closely. <laughs> uh, those words, no, they were so inelegant. Uh, I, I really hope they're never used again. But 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 I hope. But, but I think that's something that you know will come in the wash up. <laughs> we haven't had the wash up yet. Would you believe? Yeah. All right, I do have another online question. <clears throat> You've spoken of your desire to include other religious traditions in the coronation. Uh, what sorts of responses did you receive from those you invited? What kinds of concerns and adjustments were broached? Yeah. Um, so there were, there were all, so there, there were, so I, I, I said those actually taking a part in the ceremony, sort of handing over regalia were, were, were generally lords and they were peers, lords and ladies from the, from the House of Lords, um, so they already had a sort of relationship with the monarch in that respect. So they were there both as peers and as representing their faith traditions. Um, the actual faith leaders, so it was always intended that there needed to be a moment when the king could, could, could meet them, could acknowledge them directly. Um, and we went backwards and forwards about whether that should happen at the beginning of the service. So there was one thought that they might be at the door to greet the king. Um, then logistically that was going to be complicated. Uh, so then the idea was that they would be at the door to say farewell to the king, and they were all going to be mic'd up, and they were all going to say words of greeting to the king. Then because it was a Sabbath, the chief rabbi said, I can't use a microphone, so none of them could have mics. Um, and they all ended up saying the same thing. Uh, um, so, yeah, we kind of had to feel our way very, very carefully. But, but, I, but I think... We, we, uh, I'm still quite proud of what we achieved, so, so that there was participation, there was representation, um, but hopefully not, not doing anything that, that undermined anybody. Um, I, I, I suspect it will be different next time. <laughs> they, will, they will keep thinking about, about this, yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't see anyone else getting up, and I'm... If, Oh, oh, okay, Bruce, yeah, go ahead. I, I, 
I want to know, you know, I heard all the monarchs and everybody in the royalty that's buried there, but when you look at, I remember that Stephen Hawking was buried in, yeah. how, who decides who gets buried there? Mm. Um, one person, the Dean of Westminster, ultimately decides who is, who, who is buried or who has a memorial um, set up in the Abbey. So, the, so this was the previous Dean uh, who uh, decided to offer the family of Stephen Hawking that he'd be buried there. Um, and he's buried there obviously because of his, his contribution to science, so he's buried quite close to Isaac Newton. There's a kind of little scientist's corner, a bit like Poet's Corner. Um, and so it was felt his, his, his scientific contribution, so our understanding of creation, um, and, and also the sort of the, the, uh, the testimony of his life, really. Uh, uh, um, you know, we, we, we don't have many people who had evident disabilities <laughs> buried in the Abbey. They're not well represented. Um, so so it, it, there, were all, there were all kinds of reasons. There is the, of course, he had a, uh, a slightly combative uh, re relation to religion, um, organised religion. His family, interestingly, many of them are very, very faithful indeed. Um, and, it was, and it was, in fact, you know, they, they, in the end, said, uh, actually, you know, I think, all in all, he would have been really chuffed to know that he was being you know, really, really pleased, really proud um, to, be, to be buried in Westminster Abbey near um, uh, Isaac Newton. But I, you know, Darwin isn't very far away either. <laughs> he, he's buried, buried quite closely. Um, and I, I think that's, again, one of the things that makes the Abbey interesting, is that I, I think it's a place where we don't, where we try not to duck difficult conversations and we try to be a, a space, a convening space where, yeah, we know who we are, we're a Christian church, we know what we're about in that respect, but that we are about trying to reconcile worldviews, cultures, ideas, that, that, that in a very fractious society, we might be a place that tries to offer us a, a place where there might be some sort, of, some sort of healing, some sort of reconciliation based on our faith in Christ. You know? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one final question, if I could, um, which is um, for the funeral of the queen or the coronation of the king, here you are, and you hinted at this, you know, this sense of how did I end up here, right? You're a person who didn't begin your career as a pastor or a priest, and, and so you're serving in that role now, um, but you're also a, a citizen of the country, you're burying the only queen you've ever known, and that, or in the case of the coronation, you're beginning a reign of a brand new king. Can you, I don't know, can you say a bit about how, what, what were you feeling in either of those moments in ter as, as a human being, as a citizen, as a, yeah. as a member of, the, uh, of Britain? I mean, huge sort of privilege and gratitude, really. Um, uh, but there's something, um, you know, these, these things are quite helpful, aren't they? The, the sort of sense that you kind of know what your job is, that your, your, your job is, you know, if you're there, you're the one who's been called in alongside at this significant moment, so you, you do your job. You, you, you try to make sure that the liturgy is beautiful and has dignity and points heavenward and... and uh, you, you know, you, you, you try to get out of God's way. <laughs> you know? um, uh, and, yeah, being alongside people at significant moments in, in their lives is part of the privilege of an ordained life. And whether that's a king <laughs> or, uh, you know, I, I've worked in, um, children's, in a children's hospice, so, you know, the sense, actually the sense of privilege of being alongside people at those incredibly significant moments, um, that, that's, that, that, actually, that feeling is the same, oddly. Don't applaud yet, just a minute. We have a small gift for Mark here. Oh. I will say too that Mark came over the pond, as they say, 
um, only to do this talk. And he got here yesterday. He flew in yesterday morning to Chicago, spent a little bit of time with his family there. Um, and he it just arrived in the Twin Cities this afternoon. So I don't have any idea what time it is based for your no, body no, right now. You no, probably no, don't no, want to no, know. No, 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 thank you. But your ability to come over here so quickly and sound so coherent and thoughtful is a gift. He also, you can keep him in your prayers. He flies back to London tomorrow and he has to lead worship on Saturday morning at the Abbey. Uh, at which point I would imagine he's going to want a nap. <laughs> In any case, we are so glad you have been with us. Thank you, by the way, for, to all of you for joining us both online and in person. Um, but thanks for coming. It's, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. And we have a small gift, which I hope you will display proudly. It's a little piece of granite, which says, with thanks to Mark Burke, Birch for bringing faith to life. And we are so grateful to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.